Remain seated, please. Permanecer sentados, por favor. So a couple weeks ago, Disney Channel released a preview of the theme song for the new animated comedy Primos. Primos is the story of Tater, a 10-year-old Mexican-American girl living in California whose 12 chaotic cousins move in for the summer and help her discover her true self. When the show was first announced, I thought it had a fun premise and would lead to some really great Mexican-American representation. Then they released the theme song. All traces of the show's intro have since been pulled from Disney Channel's official socials with the exception of YouTube, and there's no word on what's going to happen with the show yet. Is it still airing as planned? Is it going to be retooled? Is it cancelled? Who knows? All we know is that the 60 second intro angered a lot of people. I don't want to talk about this too much since several people have already done videos breaking this down. But ultimately, I think the crew thought, well, the show is based on a showrunner's childhood, that's all the research we need. And then, as so often happens on the internet, genuine criticism quickly got taken over by bad faith criticism, bullying, and people going out of their way to spread misinformation. There's even been gatekeeping saying that the show's creator, Natasha Klein, quote, isn't actually Hispanic, and that she and Disney were doing this whole show as cultural appropriation, which is just very wrong. And I think there's also some further, much more nuanced discussion to be had about how a lot of other Latin American subcultures tend to look down on people who immigrated to the U.S. and became more Americanized. Hmm, I wonder if a similar theme will come back later in this video. I'm definitely not the right person to talk about the nuances of Chicano culture. Chicano, noun, an American of Mexican origin or descent. But hey, maybe Tater's voice actor could clear all this up for us. The Spanish language is not a Latin American language. It's a language the Spanish conquistadors forced upon Latin American people. The only reason we're Latin people and not Native American people is because of that distinction. So be mad at me all you want for misspelling words in Spanish. Be mad at me all you want for mispronouncing words in Spanish. That doesn't take away from the fact that I am a Mexican American Native American woman. Honey, you're literally speaking English right now. What the actual fu- Yeah, she really made this so much worse. And to be clear, that is not Natasha Klein. That is Myrna Velasco, the voice of Tater on the show. Who also posted something back in 2019 that called Mexico a hole. And like, yeah, obviously it's a Donald Trump reference, but... It also doesn't read like she's actually being sarcastic, and if anything, she's kind of agreeing with him. Like, I know tone is a hard thing to convey in text, but come on. By the way, the actual canon answer, according to the show's creator Natasha Klein, as to why Tater uses the wrong conjugation and says Oye Primos instead of Oigon Primos, is that Tater doesn't speak much Spanish in her household. So yes, it's intentionally incorrect. Because Tater is a child whose first language is English. Oh, and really quick, I can't believe that I even have to say this. Criticize the show all you want. I'm absolutely not going to sit here as a very white dude of Canadian, French, German, and Scottish descent and tell people that their criticisms are invalid. But for the love of God, do not harass the cast and crew of this show. Natasha Klein actually did a podcast interview talking more about the show, and I'm putting that in the card above because it gives a lot of insight into her background and the inspiration for the show. The goal was never to try to speak to the experience of all Latin Americans because it's her personal story. But this all actually happened as I was writing this video, and I think it just emphasizes how important well-done representation is. And that's what shows like Amphibia, The Ghost and Molly McGee, Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur, and Hamster and Gretel have all excelled at recently. Created by Gravity Falls and Big City Greens alumni Matt Braley, Amphibia was based on the summers that he spent visiting Thailand as a kid. And Boon Choi is a Thai-American teenager from Southern California who, much like Matt Braley, is thrust into an unfamiliar world. Anne feels like an outsider at the beginning of the series when she first lands in Amphibia, but she grows and learns so much, and by the end of it, she doesn't want to leave. That's exactly how Matt Braley felt when visiting Bangkok every summer, and that Thai connection was made even stronger when Brenda Song was cast to play Anne. From that point, she and Matt Braley worked together to develop Anne into the awesome and authentic character that she is. 
And, of course, in addition to the overarching fish-out-of-water story that ultimately turns into something with much higher stakes, elements of Thai culture such as language, sports, and food are on full display in episodes like Season 1's Lilypad Thai, where Anne overhauls the local frog diner into a much nicer frog Thai fusion restaurant. Bloody ka! And welcome to Stumpy's, Wartwood's first frog Thai fusion restaurant, now with napkins! Ooh, napkins? What are those? And Season 3's Temple Frogs, where the planters go to visit Los Angeles' Thai temple with Anne and her family, and the three of them end up really connecting with Thai culture. Oh, by the way, quick side note, as I was working on this video, I finally got to try Thai iced tea for the first time because there is a new um, sushi and Thai restaurant that opened up right behind Magic Kingdom Park, and oh my god, Thai iced tea is so good. If you have not had it before... Seek it out. It is delicious. But probably my favorite detail is that Matt Braley's mom not only plays Anne's mom on the show, but also was frequently called up to make sure that they were getting pronunciations right, which is A, super adorable, and B, help them make sure everything was authentic. Now, The Ghost in Molly McGee wasn't originally pitched with Molly being Thai in mind, but the plan was always to base Molly's ethnicity around whoever they cast to play her. So, when Ashley Birch, who is half Thai and half Irish, was cast to play Molly, they made sure to represent that as accurately as possible. And I think it's extremely worth noting here, Bill Motts and Bob Roth are not Thai, but they knew how important it was to get this right, and they did the proper research. And of course, one of the main consultants they talked to was Matt Braley. What's really cool is the way that the Thai culture actually fits seamlessly with the whole premise of the show. In the first episode, Grandma Nin tells Molly about a cool Thai tradition that sticks around throughout the whole show. In Thailand, many houses have ghosts. Have I ever told you about San Tapung? Uh, no. What's that? A little house within your home to honor your ghost. Tell me more about this, please. You mean something like this? What do you think, Scratch? Got a nice open floor plan. A few cobwebs here and there. Uh, yeah, this might work. So, would it be okay if we stuck around a little while? Yeah, sure. On a trial basis. Don't forget to leave an offering of food and drink to keep your ghosts happy. They've done a handful of episodes involving Thai culture, most notably the best of Nintentions, in which Molly throws an impromptu wedding for her parents. We are gathered here today to join this mom and this dad with this Mong Kon as a symbol of their undying love times infinity. If there's anyone that objects, keep it to yourselves. And A Very Hungry Ghost, where Nin helps Molly and Daryl host a Thai festival where they feed hungry ghosts, and Molly and Daryl get up to some sibling rivalry antics. And to prepare, I need my best kitchen helpers. Best? <laughs> You're obviously talking about me, though. I understand you can't say that due to <clears throat> familial obligations. <laughs> about that one time I used salt in the sticky rice, I was fine! But an episode that's aired most recently, and an episode that's gotten absolutely rave reviews, is of course 100% Molly McGee. The episode is about Molly's relatives coming to visit. Her adorable little cousin named Emmy. Woo! Emmy! Great hug strength! I missed you so much! Her uncle David. Hope you're not too old for me to buy your love with gifts. <gasps> You know my weakness for long nose plushies! I will call you Trunky. And of course, Grandma Nin. Molly was super excited for the visit, but she quickly finds herself feeling alienated. Sorry, I don't know many Thai words. Just, hello, goodbye, I'm here to happify. <laughs> she can't speak fluent Thai. She doesn't know how to play Thai chess. She can't handle the insanely spicy chips that they're eating. This comes from the ocean? Woo! Why is it like this? It can't be that hot. <laughs> <laughs> you two are so funny. Mmm. <laughs> how are you eating those? They're like a volcano in your mouth! <laughs> you can blame your McGee side for that one, kiddo. And she starts to feel like she's not Thai enough for her own family. Why didn't Mom give me the Sukh Sai Spice Tolerance? Or, or teach me Thai or Mak Rukh? I only have one Thai parent and Emmy has two, so I'm only half Thai and maybe that's not enough. She tries to learn everything she can about being Thai and the next day tries to show off everything that she's learned. 
but she ends up getting completely overwhelmed. <laughs> Spy, spicy shrimp. <laughs> I stayed up all night, but I'm still not Thai enough. She leaves feeling defeated, and that's when her mom, Daryl, Emmy, Uncle David, and Grandma Nin come to talk to her. After seeing how Thai all of you are, I'm feeling like I'm only Thai ish, which doesn't feel like enough. You know, I've felt the exact same way myself. Really? You have? Yes, especially since moving away and letting my Thai get rusty. Same here. My wife grew up in Thailand, but I've never even been there. Makes me feel like she has more Thai points than me. Why do you think I learned Makro? Sometimes I feel not Thai enough too. What? I'm not allowed to have complex emotions? I can't hear what you're saying up there. Is it my turn yet? Grandma Nin? Yes, but I'm not climbing that ladder. When I moved to the U.S., my sister made fun of me for being too American. This episode is especially incredible because it's not just relatable to people who are of Thai descent, but rather it's relatable to pretty much anybody with mixed heritage. Being Thai isn't about what language you speak. Or how much spice you can eat. Or the games you play. Or your judgmental sister. Being Thai is part of you. And there's no right or wrong way to be you. In addition to the Thai rep compilation, I did a Jewish rep compilation since May was Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month and Jewish American Heritage Month. And unsurprisingly, a fair amount of people commented that it was interesting that Phineas and Fur, Molly McGee, and Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur all have Hispanic Jewish best friend characters. Someone else in the comments was actually kind enough to leave a whole list of Jewish Disney characters. Yeah, I actually didn't realize that Ron from Kim Possible and Tish from The Weekenders were Jewish. So yeah, there's a fair amount of Jewish representation, and not all of them are half Hispanic, but two of these shows are recent, and the other one is the one I grew up watching the most that's also coming back. Do we have chopped liver? What do you think this place is? Chopped li- Oh, that doesn't really work. Isabella was always going to be Jewish, since Isabella was named for both Dan's daughter, Isabella Pavenmeyer, and Sarah Goldberg. Uh, Isabella was originally Isabe uh, Isabella Garcia Goldberg, because she was named after one of the uh the people in our casting department who oh. was the person who like fished phineas and ferb out of the trash can to say hey this was a show you guys liked because they'd said no to it the first time it was pitched so not what we're looking for we don't want to do boys shows and then nine months later they did and goldberg sarah goldberg pulled it out of the bin and went here what about this you loved this so we owed her a lot. So we wanted to name a character after her. Apparently there's one person in the United States named Isabella Garcia Goldberg. And because there's oh. one person, if there'd have been 30 of them, they'd have gone fine. But one, they're like, you can't do it because that person could sue. And so they ultimately landed on the name of Isabella Garcia Shapiro. This is heavily referenced in the episode Picture This, where Candace visits the Mexican Jewish Cultural Festival that her mom and Isabella's mom are at while she's trying to bust Phineas and Fur. I think it's sort of meant to be a joke that Danville has such an unlikely high number of people who are specifically Mexican Jewish that they actually have enough people to have this festival, but man, this looks like a fun festival and you know they're gonna have some incredible food. Speaking of which, it seems like Isabella's lucky day in the episode It's No Picnic as all of their other friends have things to do that day. So Isabella plans to have a backyard picnic with Phineas. Wow, way to be prepared, Isabella. Just doing my fireside girl thing. I packed it with some Mexican Jewish delicacies like the filter bun. It wobbles. Ew. <laughs> <laughs> okay, they definitely made that one up. And as one of the commenters on the Jewish rep video said, kind of really want an enchilada now. How I will make one is beyond me. Yeah, I'm right there with you. I want to make one too. <laughs> Moving back over to the ghost of Molly McGee, Libby is Argentinian Jewish, and even though Libby's dad is completely MIA, her mom has clearly made a point to make sure that she can still keep in touch with that side of herself. It's Argentinian Appreciation Day. I came to share a slice of my culture. <laughs> Time to go to work, old gal. <laughs> And 
And, of course, the Jewish representation has been handled beautifully. The Hanukkah episode is one of my favorites of the entire series, and I honestly wish there were more holiday episodes like it in general, where it's just about the characters getting to enjoy the holiday in each other's company. And we get a scene where Libby and her mom reflect on their family's history, which shows that Libby's great-grandparents fled to America from Nazi Germany after the Night of Broken Glass. This menorah has been with our family through plenty of tough times. But it reminds us that even in darkness, there is light. No matter what happens, we celebrate that we're still here. Resilient, strong, and proud. The Bat Mitzvah episode focused more on the party afterwards and didn't show the actual ceremony because it was more about Molly thinking that Libby wanted some blowout party and not actually listening to what she wanted. I didn't want a big party. I didn't want all these people. You've turned this party into what you thought I wanted. Oh, so what was it that you wanted? To spend time with you! Moving on to Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur, Casey is also Jewish. Specifically, she's Puerto Rican Jewish. What is this dish called? Asapau de brisket. Puerto Rican Jewish fusion. It's me, as a dish. <laughs> and Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur gave us another great bat mitzvah episode, with this one focusing more on the actual ceremony. And the song is incredible. I can't play it here because I'm still actually hoping to get the monetization back on this channel, and I don't want to mess with that. But both bat mitzvah episodes are ultimately about realizing that the most important part of these kinds of events is that they're spent with the people you care about. And while we're on the subject of Moon Girl, I'd be crazy to not mention the episode Hair Today, Gone Tomorrow, which is an episode that focuses on black hair. People tend to criticize what they don't understand, so they tell us our natural hair is sloppy, unkept, unprofessional, or even ugly. But they're wrong. Our hair is versatile, textured, beautiful, political, powerful, bold. It reflects our culture, who we are, and what we've been through. To hear more about this episode, go listen to the episode of the podcast without a cool acronym we did about Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur, because my friend Miranda had a lot to say about that episode. She loved it. Moon Girl is just an incredible representation of how vibrant and diverse New York City is as a whole. Something that's also true of the Tom Holland Spider-Man movies, Spider-Verse, and Miss Marvel. So basically, Marvel's just been doing a really good job in general of depicting how awesome and diverse New York City is. And Moon Girl did a whole episode about how these kinds of neighborhoods can be ruined by gentrification. All that noise, both for the ear and the eye, will be a thing of the past. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, pumpkin. It's beautified. It's fancified. It's gentrified. This isn't your home improvement show. If you want to live here, you can't just change everything. And last but not least, we have Hamster and Gretel. If you know Dan Povenmire, and who doesn't at this point, you probably could immediately tell that Kevin and Gretel's dad, David, was based on him. But what you might not know is that his wife in the show, Carolina, is based on Dan Povenmire's actual wife, Clarissa, who's Venezuelan. And of course, Gretel is played by Dan's daughter, Melly, who's also the namesake of Melissa in Milo Murphy's Law. So yeah, the Grant Gomez family is based on Dan's actual family. The biggest difference being that Dan doesn't have a son, just two daughters. And in one of the first episodes of the show, Carolina plans on having a family dinner night, and Hamster and Gretel have to fly all over town to find a replacement after they think that they ruined their mom's Ropa Vieja. I was actually going to go try Ropa Vieja for this video, but the Publix that used to have it at their deli no longer sells it. But it's basically a stew consisting of slow-cooked shredded beef, usually flank steak, and roasted veggies. I'll have to seek out another place that sells it, or maybe just try making it at home. Anyways, they eventually realize that they should just remake the Ropa Vieja using their mom's recipe, and we get a really nice song about it. And it turns out that they didn't ruin the original Ropa Vieja. The thing in the other oven was actually a dirt cake. Dirt cake? It's cake that looks like dirt. You know, so obnoxious neighbors won't come over and eat it. I looked up Venezuelan cake, and the first result I got was Venezuelan coconut cream cake, which sounds incredible. Good lord, this video is making me so hungry. <laughs> Representation is so important in all media, but it's especially important in children's media, because kids are still forming perceptions about their identity, which directly affects their self-esteem. When there's no representation, or worse, characters who are just walking stereotypes... It is my Shirwani, only worn on very special occasions. Get it? It's because he's Indian. I am bummed. I wanted to play my sitar in the school band, but Mr. Collinsworth would not even let me audition. See, Robbie plays the sitar because he's from India, and everyone from India plays the sitar, right? Right? 
Mr. Kipling, you are getting a timeout and no TV for a week. <laughs> I think you are being very harsh. Mr. Kipling paid you a visit because he gets bored in his cage. Plus, he's a cuddler. See, he has a giant water monitor as a pet because he's from India, right? Every kid in India has a water monitor as a pet. Everybody's got a water monitor. Yours is fast and mine is slow. Where'd you get them? I don't know, but everybody's got a water monitor. He just hangs out with Greg because he knows he's another non... He's not cool or popular at all, and he's like, I can relate to this guy. Sasriyaka. That means both hi and bye in Punjabi. Every family is a work of art. My family is from India. My parents lived there when they were kids and then moved to America. Kids can struggle with their identity and even begin to think that their own heritage is a bad thing. Seeing someone like you be successful, kind, and vulnerable can be extremely validating. Not only that, but it's also good for kids to see that there are other people out there who are different from them. Especially those who might be in communities that are predominantly just one or a couple of demographics and aren't really exposed to much outside of that in their day-to-day -day lives. When done right, these kind of shows can actually educate people and, in the process, fight negative stereotypes. And shows like Amphibia, Molly McGee, Hamster and Gretel, and Moon Girl take great care to make sure that they get it right. So I really do hope that Primo's was ultimately just a victim of lousy first impressions and bad PR and that they're able to fix the problems with it, because I think it does have the potential to be a good show with solid representation. And I look forward to seeing Disney Channel and the Walt Disney Company as a whole continue the trend of diverse and authentic storytelling for years to come. That means thank you in Thai. Woo! Molly, you crushed it! Have fun following that, kid! You know, it's really less satisfying when they can't hear my zings.